Breaking news, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction has released some major updates to suggested alcohol guidelines. Let's dive into exactly what these changes are. In the original release of the 2011 guidelines, suggestions were made for both long-term and short-term drinking. For long-term drinking, the guidelines suggested no more than 10 standard drinks a week for women and no more than 15 standard drinks a week for men, with no more than 2 standard drinks a day on most days. For short-term drinking, such as on a single occasion, the guidelines suggested no more than 3 drinks a day for women and no more than 4 drinks a day for men. But you can scrap these guidelines now, as the new suggestions are drastically different. Firstly, the guidelines suggest that no alcohol consumption is the only way to be risk-free from diseases and harm caused from alcohol consumption. For low risk, no more than two standard drinks a week is recommended. Three to six standard drinks is considered moderate risk, and seven or more standard drinks is increasing risk. The new suggestions also state that individuals who have more than two drinks per occasion are at an increased risk of harm to themselves and others. Recommendations are based on a standard drink size, which in Canada is 17.05 milliliters or 13.45 grams of pure alcohol. In terms of common drinks, this would be 12 ounces or 341 milliliters of 5% alcoholic drinks, such as beers, coolers, and ciders. 5 ounces or 142 milliliters of 12% drinks, such as wine and 1.5 ounces or 43 milliliters of 40% alcoholic drinks, such as spirits. So these changes to the alcohol guidelines might still be unknown to much of the public. Let's see what the university body has to say about them. So have you heard of the new alcohol changes in the guidelines? I actually have, because I work at a grocery store and oh. we need to know the alcohol guidelines because I'm like a supervisor who rings it through. Interesting. Yeah. What are your opinions about these changes? I personally don't consume alcohol, so it doesn't really affect me too much. So I'm not personally affected by it. I don't really think it's that big of a deal, but other people have very differing opinions. Have you heard about the recent changes in the alcohol guidelines? Honestly, no. Okay, so basically the guidelines went from 10 drinks a week for women and 15 drinks a week for men down to only two drinks a week per person. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a big difference. Yeah. It is. So how do you feel about these changes? I feel like it's a little a little extra. It's a little, I don't know, over-exaggerated. Like two drinks is like not that much in my opinion. So like, wait, was it 10 for men or 10 for women, 15 for men? Yeah. Yeah. So it goes down to two. Like that's a, that's a big jump. Have you heard about the recent changes in the alcohol guidelines? Um, no. Okay. So basically they went from 10 drinks a week for women and 15 oh, drinks just, a week yeah. for men down to two. Okay, yeah. So what are your feelings or thoughts about these changes? I don't know, like do what you want. At the end of the day, it's your opinion of what you do with yourself. No one, like, you can put these laws, but people will do what they want, right? As you can see, there are various opinions about the new changes in these guidelines. Now let's dive into the history of how these guidelines were created and what led to the new ones. In 2011, the low-risk drinking guidelines were created to provide Canadians with advice on how to minimize long-term risk of serious diseases that are caused by alcohol consumption in the long-term and short-term. These included scenarios involving single-time overconsumption of alcohol and the related risk of injury and acute illness. There was also specific recommendations for situations and individual circumstances that are hazardous such as in those who are pregnant, teenagers, and people on medications. The research done in 2011 looked for associations between the level of alcohol consumed and the relative risk of different diseases. To do this, researchers at the Center of Addiction and Mental Health came together to analyze systemic reviews and meta-analyses. To test the low-risk drinking guidelines, a team of researchers looked at data from individuals who followed the guidelines to see if they were at lower risk of harm. Their findings were surprising, where greater than 50% of the alcohol-caused cancer deaths were in those drinking within the guidelines. Moreover, 
65% of hospital stays in British Columbia were due to unintentional injuries in individuals who stayed within the 2011 guidelines. There was also a substantial amount of deaths, with 18% of people dying from digestive conditions and 40% from injuries. Since 2011, there have been many evolutions in the knowledge and estimates of relationships between alcohol use and its relation to particular diseases, disorders, and injuries. Given this new and relevant research, it became important to update the health guidelines. Moreover, there are several things that researchers wanted to include in the updated guidelines that were not present in the initial version. This includes a global evidence review on the effect of alcohol on health, rapid review of alcohol on mental health, a rapid review of alcohol on violence, a comprehensive review on literature on women's health and alcohol, social harms in relation to alcohol, and mathematical modeling of lifetime risk of death and disability for various levels of alcohol consumption. In a study done in 2010, alcohol was shown to have a dose-response relationship between alcohol consumption and alcohol use disorders. The relative risk of pneumonia increases with increased consumption of alcohol. There has also been research showing that Black individuals may have a greater risk of high blood pressure than Asian and Caucasian individuals with the same level of alcohol consumption. Previously, it was thought that low doses of alcohol had a protective effect on heart diseases that are typically caused by reduced blood flow to the heart. However, current research shows that this may not be the case, especially when individuals participate in binge drinking. In fact, the risk for an ischemic stroke was two times greater among binge drinkers than non-binge drinkers. What exactly is binge drinking? According to the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, it is defined as consuming more than five standard drinks for men and four standard drinks for women in one sitting. Binge drinking is also significantly associated with a range of social and health problems. Specifically, the increases in blood alcohol levels associated with binge drinking increase the risk of death from various causes, such as unintentional injuries like road crashes and drowning, physical and sexual violence, cardiovascular disease, inflammation of the gastrointestinal system, and development of an alcohol use disorder. Now that you are up to date with the new guidelines, it's up to you to make informed decisions on managing your drinking habits. So next time you are at a party or drinking with colleagues, it may be wise to think about how much you are drinking. For more information, visit the links in the description. And thank you for listening.